I'm Robert McIntosh, and I'm the chair of the Chartered Association of Business Schools, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to this our Talking Heads series of interviews and to introduce Emma Hardy, MP. Emma comes to us uh, to this conversation with a long affiliation with uh, the education sector, having started out as a primary school teacher for 10 years before moving to a full-time role with one of the teaching unions and in 2017 being elected to the Westminster Party uh, Parliament as a Member of Parliament and now picking up the brief for higher education as a Shadow Minister. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you Emma and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Um, and we're going to have a quick conversation around some issues relating to business school provision in higher education. And where I wanted to start was by noticing that business schools are incredibly important in the international reach of the universities in which we sit. Roughly one in three of all university students that are international in the UK are studying a business related degree, but they also play a really important part in the local economies in your own constituency in Hull, there's a business school with uh, your namesake actually as Dean. And so I wanted to start by asking you about what you think government can do to support the business school sector and its international uh, activities. And then to follow that up with a more local conversation about how business schools can get more engaged in the local economy in which they sit. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, to chat to you this morning. Um, in terms of sort of what government can do a bit more, I think there were a few positives to take from this horrendous pandemic. I think one of them has been a recognition of the uh, sustainability of higher education and maybe how higher education has become increasingly reliant on international students and the contribution that international students bring, not only in terms of the great mix of different cultures and different expertise, but also in the recognition of the huge financial contribution that, that they bring to this country. And I'm hoping that will influence a much more sensible discussion around work visas, around study permits, and around how we sort of move forward from this pandemic. There is still an awful lot of fear, though, out there at the moment, as universities are still not sure what's happening with international students in January. And I do think the United Kingdom's government in particular needs to think about the consequences of uh, any impact on our international reputation and what that might have on the number of people wanting to come and study in our country as well. Now, I understand that the university's minister has been uh, having conversations to sort of say to the international community that the UK is open and ready for, uh, ready for business, ready to welcome international students. But I, I do also think that the government needs to have a look about the impact of moving EU students into the international bracket and what impact that's going to have on, on, on numbers as well because EU students currently make up, as, a, as you know, 30% of the UK's total international students. And, and it requiring those people to have a visa to come and study in the UK, that needs to have the systems in process. It needs to have systems that will work effectively. And we, we're running out of time during a pandemic to get all this working effectively and properly uh, by uh, January. Because visa and health costs are more expensive for international students. So again, that's something that the government might look at if we really want to attract international students, we want to think about how welcoming do we make things? How easy is it for them to come over here and study? What support is available for them while they're, while they're studying here at the moment? So I think the introduction of the graduate immigration route has, is, a positive, uh, is a positive thing, allowing people to stay here for two years after graduate, graduating, that is a, is a good thing. But these are the kind of conversations that government needs to be having at the moment. And I suppose the, the thing about particularly postgraduate international students is that they make their decision as to where to study over usually quite a long time. It's not a snap judgment. It's a thing that they have prepared for for a few years. So certainty and stability in the immigration context and the kind of regulatory framework from which they will uh, make their decision is really important. And that does appear to be changing rapidly and, and not yet settled. So I, I would agree with those comments. Um, and also, of course, that the, the huge value that international students bring in monetary terms, but also in international mm -hmm. relationships and so on. If we turn our attention to our, our more local environment, how can business schools get more engaged with the local economies in which we sit? 
And, and sorry, just on the sort of our, you know, the soft power and influence that yeah. having international students bring, because I think that sometimes um, isn't mentioned enough. I found it incredibly impressive when you look at the number of world leaders or people serve, serving in sort of governments around the world and how many of those people were educated here in the United Kingdom. You know, we're talking, you know, on the 1st of January, we have left the European Union. We are going to be on our own. We're going to be looking at trying to build relationships with different countries. And that sort of soft power that we have from the number of people in positions of power around the world who came and studied here in the UK, I, I don't think should be taken for granted. It needs to be really recognised and really sort of nurtured and developed, I think, by the government that actually making our country as attractive as possible for international students and the bureaucracy, you know, the bureaucracy involved in it as simple and as easy as possible. As you're saying, not only does that bring wealth, not only does that bring sort of, you know, mix of culture and expertise, but it also actually grants us uh, power going forward. But on the sort of local role, I think people have heard me talk an awful lot about um, civic universities and sort of my vision for how civic universities are going to work. And I think business schools, there's a huge opportunity for them to be working with their local communities. I mean, the impact that COVID-19 has had on our economy is, is devastating. It's going to be absolutely devastating. I mean, it's changing the whole way we work. We're doing it right now with the fact we're having this meeting on Zoom. It, it's revolutionising, you know, the way that businesses work and, and operate. And there could be some, some positive things from this. I mean, representing the area I do of, of Hull, there could be some opportunities for more graduate jobs if more people are allowed to work remotely in, in different regions around the UK. So that could be a positive impact of the virus. But it is whatever's going to happen, things are going to change. All we can be certain of is there's going to be change. And the business schools and the way they can support businesses in the local community to adapt to this complete change in how they operate. If, if, they're, uh, you know, if they're selling on retail, how do they work in this sort of new automated world? It is absolutely crucial. And so I would be looking at sort of if that's not happening, sort of why is it not happening? Because there's clearly a need there in the local communities. There's this expertise in the business school. And part of my vision in the civic university uh, sort of agenda is about how the universities embed more and work more and support their local communities. So I'd be really keen to sort of learn about best practice around the country, which business schools are doing this effectively. You know, where is it really working and how can we replicate that for business schools up and down the country? And in terms of that civic engagement, some of that comes down to structures and, and, and for, for forums and formats where people can have those conversations. And from your perspective, either in local government or in national government, is there a role there to try and foster those relationships, uh, particularly to the smaller businesses? I'm, I'm thinking, of course, that the larger corporate businesses and our large public organisations have tend to have connections and, and resources, but the smaller businesses, which may be those that are most directly impacted by the pandemic, may not have those. So I'm thinking about ways in which we could reach out and, and where would the forums or platforms be for that to occur? Well, I mean, there are, there are a number, and obviously the devolution agenda offers more opportunities to sort of look at how business schools can get more involved. I mean, on, certainly in different boards, LEP boards around the country, there's quite often vice chancellors are invited to sit on those. And there's different sort of, you know, cham local chambers of commerce. I mean, there are lots of different organisations out there who uh, who bring together different businesses in the local area and, and try and sort of, you know, support them as a chambers, Federation of Small Businesses, the LEPs as well as there's business advisory boards as well that often work with local authorities. So there's all these different organisations out there. And I'd be very interested to know how many business schools actually send a representative to some of these meetings, how many of them actually engage with some of these things that are happening in their local community. And if they're not, then how do we incentivize them to get involved and, and, and make it sort of, you know, where you're sharing this expertise? Because there is all this expertise in our universities but it sometimes feels with, with the universities, and I've talked about that difference in terms of civic university, instead of the university being sort of, the university being our university, belonging to the community rather than it just being that it happens to be in that particular town, but it's part of that town and it's supporting that town to sort of grow and develop. And I mean, so there are obviously incentives that government could ask, um, could ask for in terms of, you know, the remit for governing boards and, and you know, who should sit or not sit on the governing board. 
But I would assume that for a lot of these organisations, the door would be open if the business school was proactive in contacting them about it. And you mentioned earlier the, 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 the kind of issues around, for example, retailing on, online, that you know, some of that is going to be a huge opportunity as well as huge cost. I'm interested, I suppose, in your, your perspective on some of the more social dimensions of the pandemic and the economic recovery that we face and how business schools could engage not just with business models and business advice, but also with the social dimension of the change that we, that we are experiencing. Well, I mean, one of the, to go on one of my pet projects, one of the things I think business schools could do more sort of directly is sort of work with schools and work with school pupils around sort of uh, money and finance and advice and supporting sort of entrepreneur projects. Because I think what we've seen during this pandemic is those incredibly large global companies increase profits at an at a astounding rate, while our local independents are closing down around our high streets and and in front of our very eyes every time I sort of enter the high street I sort of notice more shops sort of closed down and yet you sort of read the profit margin of companies like Amazon and they're going through the roof so I you know I do think you know there could be sort of more looking at supporting people in that area I mean I've spoken you know a number of times about my vision of social mobility not meaning geographical mobility why should people have to feel that they, they need to get on in life they need to leave the area where they're from and one of those things I think so crucially important that universities could do is generate graduate jobs in that area, not just by being an employer, but actually I know some universities have done this, supporting entrepreneurs, supporting graduates to become entrepreneurs, to be working in their local area and to actually be uh, wealth creators as well as employers. And I've seen this in Manchester University have uh, have done this, Middlesex I know do this as well. They support lots of their students to become entrepreneurs. And I think that's something business schools can look at because you know the, the government have spoken an awful lot about uh, leveling up and obviously we're yet to see what that's actually gonna look like. But there is a role for business schools in this. There is a role for them to look at how do you, how do you work in that area to not just train people so they leave the area and go and move to London to go and uh, run a business but how do you sort of support people to uh, you know to be successful in, in the area in all areas around the country so you have more of that equal sort of you know equal growth up and down the country and because to be honest it, it just hasn't been for the for the past few decades I mean the growing inequality but the, there is a role for business schools to play their part in, in helping to sort of minimize that. And of course, roughly one in four of all student-led uh, startup businesses come or involve students who've studied business. So I think there's a real opportunity there and, and large numbers of business schools have incubator spaces or the opportunity to work with startup businesses or to become a startup business. That also touches into the thing that we started with about international and local. So many of the students that come to our UK business schools go back to wherever They've come from in the world and that produces the soft power that you spoke about, but also uh, they, you know, they create businesses and they create opportunities and connections and some of them will move to different parts of the same country, but many of them have the opportunity to stay. And so that levelling up of economic activity, I think, is, is really important. Um, and for smaller businesses, I think that the, the challenge is trying to find the relationship to the university and to the business school community in particular um, and so that takes me on to my next topic that I wanted to ask you about, which was around research priorities. And so uh, with roughly 1% of the UK government's research spend lands in business schools. And aside from hoping to see that percentage go up, uh, which is one kind of question, the, the second part of my question really is um, what, what should the business school community be focusing on in its research activities in particular in the light of the pandemic and the levelling up agenda that you've spoken about and the social mobility and social inclusion possibilities that that levelling up brings? Yeah, in terms of sort of research funding, I mean, a lot of that is obviously covered by um, my colleague, Chiawana, who's who looks at sort of, uh, looks at all that side of our research. I mean, just as sort of a, a generic answer to that, I would obviously like to see 
um, research investment spread more evenly throughout the regions. And I know that government is sort of looking at this whole programme around research investment and how that's all going to work. But in terms of what they can research, I mean, when I was on the Education Select Committee, we talked about the fourth industrial revolution. We talked about the impact of, of automation and how that's going to change things. And even at that time when we were learning about it and we went to Germany, went to various countries to go and find out what they were doing, no one obviously foresaw the pandemic coming and it feels like we've had years of change crammed into six months i mean things have sort of changed beyond recognition in the way that we learn in the way that we arrange meetings in the way sort of business models operate in the working from home agenda not everything when we come out of this pandemic is going to flip back to how it was but there are you know there are opportunities here real opportunities how do we have sort of green growth i mean you know we're seeing the crisis of what's happening with the environment and it's incredibly depressing when you look at the statistics and you look at what's going on and how much of it you can't reverse now because we've, we've taken it too far so how do we have that green inclusive uh, you know growth up and down the country how can businesses uh, business schools sort of do that research that shows that actually it's profitable to sort of you know develop in this set you know to develop in a in a green way and also in terms of how you know workers are sort of treated you know, new models of sort of working this site i think the idea that anyone has a career one career for their whole life is clearly gone <laughs> so how do business schools sort of support people sort of throughout their different uh, different stages of learning i mean labor talk an awful lot about lifelong learning it's something i'm incredibly passionate about i mean there are lots of exciting i think opportunities out there but you know how, how do we Sort of, you know, we have this opportunity created by the pandemic to really think about what kind of society we want to live in, what our values are, how do we want our business model to work? You know, do we want everyone to go back to sort of traveling around on the underground, packed in like sardines to get somewhere and spend an hour and a half going to work? Do we want everyone to continue to, you know, driving into our cities? Isn't there an opportunity to really think about, you know, a, a better way? Of living is some a way of living that doesn't sort of create the mental health crisis that we're seeing in in our society and i think there is a exciting opportunity for business schools to sort of model it prove it and then hopefully replicate that good practice up and down the country and so the the things that you spoke about there in terms of changing to work practice uh, you know the, what it, what it means to to be employed in relation to where you work and how you work but strikes me as opening up a whole range of possibilities. So I think that's a really important research agenda, thinking of ways in which that could be more inclusive and more sustainable in terms of the consumption of resources and the, the sustainability and long-term view of investment and profit, uh, they, they are important agendas. Um, I'm wondering whether you, uh, as, a, as a sort of sidebar reflection, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist as to what will flow from the that the working practice is part of the pandemic. Clearly it's having awful health consequences and awful economic consequences, but are you optimistic that it will actually bring us some medium term benefits in terms of rethinking the nature of work? Sort of yes and no. I mean, I am generally an optimist. I think you have, if you're a Labour MP, you have to be. <laughs> so I am generally quite optimistic. But yes, I was talking to sort of in my local chamber of commerce, I sort of meet with them fairly regularly and, and speak to them about how the situation is going. And I was talking to people involved in the sale of property. And they were telling me that um, on the east coast, in sort of which are quite uh, sort of poorer areas of the country, there's been lots of people interested in buying houses, and almost a little bit of a housing boom going on along the east coast, as people have decided, after spending months maybe in their flats with no garden, no access to outside, they actually want to go and move to be by the coast where you can buy more, you know, a bigger house for the money that you're spending and still be able to work remotely. And I thought that was really interesting that this is already starting to happen. And I'm wondering, this would be quite exciting for representing, as I say, an area like Hull, for this to be a model to go forward so that you could sort of stay in, in an area like Hull where you can buy a much bigger house for less money and have therefore you know, a nicer lifestyle because you have your garden and you have your space rather than sort of being, you know, being in London, but be able to work, you know, work remotely and maybe only travel down sort of, you know, one day every fortnight or something, you know, to go and work face to face. So I think 
it's interesting that obviously people who are buying uh, buying these properties on the east coast on the seaside obviously think this is going to be a long-term sustainable model because they've just invested in property but it's it's really interesting seeing sort of what's already happening in the in the housing market and patterns and if that does continue then i think that'll be really good for certain regions of the uk so if you've got people moving there who've got money to spend in their local economy and you know, buying property, properties and investing in that area, then that's going to generate some sort of, you know, small economic growth in, in these different parts of the country if this model is allowed to go on. And also we've seen this, you know, in the clean air. I mean, it was a, it was amazing. When you look at the information on air pollution we were, when we were in the last lockdown when, you know, how dramatically it improved because we weren't all driving everywhere and how people talked about hearing, you know, nature in a way that they've not done for years. I mean, some of these things could could continue. I mean, if we didn't have to physically sort of travel everywhere for work, but then of course, then you have the, I suppose a bit where I might be a little bit non-negative about then this, uh, these advantages are obviously only able to be taken by people who already have the money to invest in the digital infrastructure and the equipment. So it's how do we make this inclusive? Because what we don't want to see is I think what we've seen uh, during lockdown was people on minimum wage jobs you know our key workers working in retail being paid really poorly having an incredibly difficult time during lockdown whereas some of the rest of us were able to spend a little extra time in the garden and decorate our properties during lockdown because we were able to work from home so as a Labour member of parliament it's all about how we can all benefit how it can be an inclusive benefit uh, benefit for everyone I think is is the challenge. And, and that digital levelling up uh, agenda, I think, requires some thought about infrastructure and social inclusion and pricing, but does open up the possibility of much, much more diversity in our economic growth, which is very heavily concentrated in some parts of the, you know, the already urbanised parts of our country. So I think that's a real plus. I want to just go back briefly to the thing that you mentioned about lifelong learning and just reflect for a moment on how best to incentivize that? It does seem likely, unfortunately, that significant numbers of people and businesses will be disrupted to the point where they may have to retrain and reskill. Do you have a view as to what the most effective way of incentivizing that is and how to get the business school community to engage with that? Yeah, I think some of the things the government have started to look at, which are quite uh, quite interesting, and obviously I want to see the details of them, but modular learning is something the Labour Party's been talking about for quite a long time, because if you can break something up and make it more accessible. I think we should also look at the fact higher education, for understandable reasons, because of the way that it's funded, has developed a model where it's very um, based around people being 18 and living away from home and working full time, you know, and we've seen a decimation in the terms of mature students and the terms of part time students, real, which is a, a, you know, a direct consequence of the funding model that we've had uh, with, you know, in the past sort of number of years. So we need to sort of be looking at that. If you're going to encourage people to develop lifelong learning, then you need to have the support there and you need the financial support. I mean, the government have talked again about sort of, you know, offering this level three opportunity for adults, but there's been no mention of maintenance to go with it, with it or how that would impact on if that adult was receiving benefits, how it would impact on uh, benefits and the requirements that are statutory under universal credit. So, I mean, there's an awful lot of information yet to be seen. So if we're going to encourage lifelong learning, then I think we need to be looking, obviously, at you know, removing what I call removing the barriers to learning. So let's look at what the barriers are. Let's look at the reasons why people don't go and then let's find policy ways to remove them. So one reason people don't continue learning is, is it's expensive. Another reason is they don't have the time if they're already working. So how do we look at sort of addressing that? I mean, I've sort of played around with this idea around this uh, right to learn and whether you could in, incentivize businesses to offer people for people to have a statutory right to time off to engage in learning programs and um, it's because that's a, obviously a barrier the other barrier of course is confidence but then if you you know if you bite size things and break it down and the open university are obviously wonderful at doing this to sort of take those small steps for people to encourage them back into the world of learning so all these all these barriers need to be sort of identified if you identify the problem then look at identifying the solution a solution to it because it's quite clear that people at the moment mature students are there's not many going back into education 
And then if they do go back into education, there's a higher dropout rate. So really understanding, you know, why do people drop out? Why don't they engage in the first place? Because if, if we don't, you know, if, if we don't do that, then we're going to have potentially an entire generation of people left out of the job market because the skills that they learned maybe 20 years ago are not needed in this in this newly changed world of work in which we're facing. And, and that to me is completely unacceptable and cannot be allowed to happen for, you know, for, not just for our economy, but actually for people's well-being and mental health. And uh, going back to your sense of optimism, I share that sense of optimism. So some of what the university sector has had to learn has mimicked that sense of a very compressed development process where we very rapidly moved to online and digitally supported uh, forms of learning, which lend itself much more easily to the sort of bite-sizing and uh, micro-credentialing approaches. So there may be opportunities there, but I think it's a really important point you make about the support, not just for the education, but for the opportunity of education and the support and costs around that, whether it's in work or out of work. Um, so I think that there's lots to think through there. And I wanted to just close off by asking you for a reflection on the positioning of higher education and in particular business education in the sort of public narrative that we hear now. Universities were largely just taken for granted, I think, in, in years gone past. But now, if you do see coverage around universities, it's often around student uh, numbers. Uh, it's around vice chancellor salaries. It's around so-called so low-valued degrees. And it does feel to me like there's a debate about participation levels in higher education. Do you have views on how the business school sector in particular could make sure that it's played as positively as possible and, and understood as in the round as to the contributions that we make both to society and to the economy? Well, I, I think it goes back to what I was talking about in terms of the civic university agenda. Because obviously people who've been to university will, generally speaking, praise universities and, and higher education. But of course, as 50% you know, of the population haven't been to university, may have never engaged in, in higher education and may have, if we're being honest, um, not always the best impression of students if they're living in a particular uh, area. So they might not have had a positive impression or feeling from the university in their local area. But this is this is why I partly why I think the civic university agenda is so important, because when people start to see the impact the university is having on their lives, regardless of the fact whether or not they have personally engaged in that university. I think that's when you start to have a different conversation. I'll give you a quick example. So the University of Hull are doing loads and loads of research and work into flooding and they're trying to really promote that you know, to, to people in the local area. Because if, they, if they're successful with all the research they're doing on flood sustainability, then of course that's going to have a massively positive impact on the city of Hull, which is you know, below sea level. So we kind of need this research quite quickly. So you know, it, it's all about, I think, really having that relevance to people's everyday lives. And we're seeing it more and more. We're seeing sort of universities offer, you know, university law schools offering free uh, legal advice to people in the local community. We've seen some businesses doing it in supporting sort of entrepreneurs when they, you know, a number of years after they graduate. So we, we are starting to see it. But if you want to, if the sector wants to sort of, you know, prove its worth, and it doesn't have to convince the 50% who went there, it needs to look at convincing the 50% who didn't. And, the, and I think sometimes with the higher education sector, and I've certainly found this since I've been shadow minister, is that there's this amazing things happening like absolutely incredible things happening and yet no one seems to know about it it's almost like the sector doesn't like to blow its own trumpet and I think you need to start telling people some of the incredible work that you're uh, you know that you're all actually doing and being an optimist from the pandemic we're seeing that a lot more we've talked about the vaccines talk about testing you know people are talking about the research the medical research that's happening in universities on a much higher level than I think they ever have before. I mean, nobody, you know, before the pandemic was talking about vaccine trials that are happening in universities, but they've been going on in universities for years and years. So it is starting to change, but it is about, you know, we've got a, a government with a particular narrative and people talk quite a lot about culture wars and the influence they have on, on elections. But I don't think universities need to stay away from that sort of, 
you know, that crossfire and just look at sort of how the view really put down the roots in the local communities and show how, you know, the difference that you're making, not just to the students who, who attend your university, but to the whole community around. And not just in terms of the financial contribution that you give, but also all those other things that are, are going on at the moment that I think the general public are just not aware of. Thanks, Emma. That's been a really useful uh, overview. I, I would, I'm going to close by uh, making one party political point on behalf of the Chartered Association of Business Schools that if we are lucky enough to get a successful vaccine, there's at least as much business and organisational research needed to figure out how to distribute it safely and securely at scale. And, you know, the, the medicine and science is one part of that, but the business and managerial and organisational research is, is another part of that. You wouldn't expect me to miss the opportunity to make that point. But I think this has been a really interesting conversation that's picked up the opportunities that digital levelling up is going to bring, the, the, the challenge of lifelong learning, the civic mission that you've talked about very eloquently and how we best engage with that. But I think for me, the key takeaway here is the need to focus on reaching out to the 50% of the population who haven't been to university, which might be in one part through lifelong learning later in life, but equally needs to be about that rounded sense of the contributions that the university and the business school community in particular are making in a variety of ways that we've covered. So thank you very much for your time, Emma, and I hope that you continue to stay safe and well. And on behalf of all my colleagues at the Chartered Association of Business Schools, thanks for your input and insight this morning. Thank you. Bye.